be another amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you brought us here. Thank you for your word. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for the proper vision that you have given us. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you speak to every heart and give us understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. And the understanding you give us will bear fruit in our homes, will bear fruit in our schools, will bear fruit on the field, and bear fruit everywhere in our country in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. A good, good amen before you sit down. God bless you. Consider today, we're coming to James chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, But be ye doers of the word. Hold on there. Be ye doers of the word. We've heard a lot. From the beginning on Thursday, was the women's conference, the men's conference, and then all the things that we have shared together. Our speakers who gave seminars, who gave goodwill messages, and all the people that have spoken, they have given us a word, the word. Everything is coming from the background of God's word, God's will, God's way, and God's wisdom. Now, the believer needs to understand that we'll be doers of the word. These uh, meetings we've heard from Thursday until today, and we're finalizing and concluding tomorrow. It's not an evangelistic meeting. It's not a meeting to get people to the church or even into salvation. That may surprise you. When I, as a teacher, I go to a class to teach mathematics. I'm not teaching mathematics to make them make a decision for Christ. I'm there for that important subject that will affect their well-being, that will affect getting a job, that will affect manufacturing. And I'm teaching them so that they will have a part to play in making a change in their community. Am I outside the world? No. I'm in the world because God wants every man, every woman to know his part in subduing the world. If he's going to do that, he needs the mathematics that I teach. And that time, I'm not preaching the gospel in particular. I am preaching and I am explaining how they make it in life. They need that mass for engineering. They need that mass for constructing bridges. They need that mass in everything they do, engineering, whatever. They need it in accountancy and in world that is upside down, that cannot do well in accounting cannot do well in finance, cannot do well in logic, logical reasoning. That world will collapse and there will be no way to preach the gospel. When a teacher who teaches English is teaching English so that we'll be able to communicate, it's not there preaching the gospel. So this week, as we have been here, we didn't come to influence people to this religion or that religion. We wanted to make people a better mother, a better father, 
a better husband, a better wife, a better professional person, a, pe a better administrator, a better governor, a better person in office, in governance. And uh, so you need to understand that the way we have approached everything we did from Thursday to Friday, to Saturday, Sunday, and also as we are looking at this today, this one is not like evangelistic preaching. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, we do. But Peter, who had to do that, he was a fisherman. And we need fishermen in the nation. And yet Peter was see a fisherman who had not known the techniques and the principles and the practical things to do to really fish. And when you do the fishing, how do you sort out the good ones and the bad ones? If Peter did not know that, how do you get the ones that are good into a place? How do you put them in the fridge? How do you preserve them so that they will still be edible when the people come to buy if you don't know the different kinds of fish that you are giving to the people, how many of them are solved and are stopped with mercury in the river? And because of the mercury they have already absorbed in the river, it damages their health and they die prematurely. If the fisherman does not know all that, if he does not know the impurities that come into the sea because of at the spring of that sea, they did a lot of corrupting things, uh, you know, passing feces and things there. Everything is flowing down, and he is fishing over there. No. The preaching of the gospel, yes, but the word that makes a man a fisherman. A hunter, a person who is walking in on the meat that comes to society. If the fellow does not know anything about all that, all he knows everywhere he goes, we are sinners. Yes, we know. But those sinners are going to die earlier than they should die if we don't know how to have better people in society. That's why we are doing what we are doing. The change make us international, that God will change every one of us. There's change in salvation that prepares you for heaven. There is change on earth that prepares you for how to live, how to act, how to think, how to interact, how to communicate, and how to concentrate on the things that benefit everybody in the nation. And so the believers and the Christians who are here as we go out, bring in everything you have heard, everything you have learned, and don't say, okay, I'm going to push him. You cannot push anybody to Christ. Teach them how to live better. Teach them how to rise higher than they have been. And then when the opportunity comes, you preach the gospel. And the gospel will save their souls in Jesus' name. I need a good, good amen. amen. So be ye doers of the word and not Hear us only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23. In verse 23, for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, how does that happen? Oh, they are talking about making society better. What I want is let them talk to me about heaven. You understand the insecurity? We have in the nation, almost in every nation, you understand? The health challenges we have in every nation, you understand? How people are living degraded lives and their lives are miserable because of the lives of other people around them. And you just tell them, believe on the Lord. Yes, we believe on the Lord. But all the people that surround us, 
they are acting you know, in a way that will suppress our lives, destroy our lives. Just believe, believe, believe. Yes, we understand. But we need to understand how do we navigate through this world. We need that so that when the pressures come, when the persecutions come, and when all those things attack our lives, what do I do when I'm under stress? What do I do when my brain is hot? What do I do when I cannot sleep? What do I do when I have a kind of disease that can easily be healed? What do I do when I see that my lifestyle is hurting me? That's where we come in. And we say, you know, in Change Makers International, this is how you adapt this, adapt that. That's not preaching the gospel, but that is an important part of our life so that we will know how to live and how to preserve our lives. So I appeal to all the Christians, all the believers who are here, and everyone who has heard of this program, Change Makers International. It is not about religion. It's not about the Great Commission as such, but it's preparatory to the Great Commission. I need to tell you that the educational system, universities were brought about by Christians because that is the practical thing we ought to do. Hospitals came up as a result of Christian impact in our world. That's not directly preaching the gospel, repent, believe, and be saved, but you see what the hospitals have done and all the gadgets we have, all the new civilization we have, look at all these lights, all these lights, the inventor, originator, Thomas Edison, he was said, you know, repent, 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 will not bring the bulbs, will not bring the electric light, and so understand, you have a part to play in the world in which you live, so that you will live a life that will benefit your neighbors all around here. You'll be a benefit. I said you'll be a benefit so that your life making you a better family man, a better family woman, you'll be able to influence in the right direction, in the positive direction, how we ought to live. And your life will attract other people unto the Lord. It says, if any man be a hearer of the word, and doeth it not, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. In verse 24, and then it says, For he beholdeth himself. He beholdeth himself. Is a welder, is not able to weld right, and he puts the gauge there. And he constructs the ceiling, but everything is falling apart. He is born again. He is saved. He has repented. He is not stealing. He is not, uh, you know, doing anything morally bad. But in his work, he has not become better. We are talking to him. We are saying there is a change that ought to take place. A change has taken place in your heart. Change must take place in your hand. The work you do. And you put your brain into that work. You put your mind into that work. But if anyone, a believer, I'm here. And he hears everything we have been saying about the change that ought to be made in our lives and in saying that one does not concern me, it concerns you. Do you see in the Bible, talking to, believe, talking to builders, that when you build the pavement, you will build the railings very well. 
That's Bible. And that so that when people are passing by, they lean on it, they will not fall to a great death and then die. God wants us to be balanced. Heart change. Hand change. Head change. I seek him for culture, everything. So that's the reason we're here this weekend. And don't let anybody go out and say, you know, our pastor is not preaching the gospel anymore. Who said that? A pastor is only now talking about this side and this side coming together, of course. God created us and we relate together. And when I was a teacher of mathematics in a secondary school, university school, when I got to the class, I didn't say, Christians, raise up your hand, Muslims, raise up your hand. I taught everyone. And when I, you know, help them in tutorials, in remedial teaching, I didn't say, are you a Christian, are you a Muslim? And then if you're a Muslim, go to... No! In all those things that relate to life, we teach everyone how to become better. And I still have that same vision. Let somebody shout, Amen! Amen. I was actually considering uh, not long ago brushing up my mats and going to, you know, some places like Deeper Life High School and lending a hand and saying, uh, this is how you do this. And all the shortcuts that I got all these, cent all these decades to go to them and say, this one is not difficult, that one is not difficult. I've gone through it. If God gives me time, you'll find me appearing in schools. <laughs> and I'll not, be, I'll not be seen when I get to the school. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that you so ever believe it. No, I'll say, what are you doing now? Quadratic equation, let's begin. And then I go through. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Be a man. Be a woman available to help people. Lift them up. You can lift them up from sin, preaching the gospel. You can lift, lift them up from suffering, from sickness. You can lift them up from poverty. Be a man, be a woman available to make the change. I will. I will. I will. I will. That's why he beholdeth is himself and goes his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25. In verse 25, it says, But whoso Lucas into the perfect law of liberty, and he continues therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. As you go out and you remember, Everything we have learned so that we become change makers in society. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will increase you. And the Lord will make you go further, farther, higher in Jesus' name. Tonight we are looking at the call and the commission of a change maker. The call and the commission of a change maker. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the response and responsibility of a change maker. Response. Everything we've heard, we need to respond. Everything we have jotted down, we need to respond. Everything we have said, I need to improve that area. I need to think of that area. I need to go this higher way, this better way. We need to respond. And response, when you join that response with ability, 
Responsibility is what we combine together to call responsibility. I've heard, I've learned, I've thought about it, I've thought through, and I've seen this is the way what keep therein. My response will generate responsibility. And then I know as a change maker, you have response, you have responsibility. Number two is the role and the role of all change makers. The role. What do I do? How do I do it? How do I get involved? How do I get connected? How do I make the lives of people around me better? The role, R-O-L-E. Now the role, when the role is called up yonder, when they call the role, the role of those who have improved their world, the role, calling the role of the people who change slaves to masters, the role, the role of the people when the role is called up yonder and your name enters into the book of people that did something, something important, something essential, something significant that you move from success and now you are moving to significance and your name is there. You are happy that you didn't come to this world and just pass through without making a mark. The role, responsibility and role, and then the role, the register of, of all change makers. Number three is the rule and the reign of the almighty change maker. That the God of heaven that helps us that inspires us, that leads us and moves us, that makes us to become achievers, that get something done, is rule in our lives. He rules our thoughts. He rules our lives. He rules our disposition. He rules everything. And then he reigns like a king because he is king of kings and the lord of lords. He rules, he reigns, and he is the Lord God Almighty. Look at number one. Number one, the response and the responsibility of a change maker. Response. Look at this story told by Jesus. Luke chapter 10. Reading from verse 25. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This man is all religious, a bundle of religion. What shall I do that I personally, individually, solely, me inherit eternal life. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, and he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? The man had been reading without response and responsibility. The people that read and read and read the Bible, but they do not have any response to the commandments of the Bible. Love your neighbor. As yourself. They're thinking of spiritual. They're thinking of eternal life. And they do not understand that what we do with our neighbor. How we act our neighbor. How we improve the lives of our neighbors. That all that is included in our response to the demand of God. In wanting to get your life eternal. Verse 27. In verse 27. And he answered. And he answering said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. With all thine heart. And with all thy soul. 
and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and, th and thy neighbor as thyself. The people who only concentrate on you love God, you worship, you pray, you give offering in a religious assembly. Our neighbors, the neighbor is dying on the, you know, on the, in the other house. And there's nobody to take him or her to the hospital. No, no, they, they can't do that. They go into worship place on Sunday and they see an accident happen. And people are crying, putting their hands on their heads. But the man, the religious man, he sees that one. No, he must not be late for the service. And he's going there to sing the songs he had sung a hundred times over and over. But this one dying by the roadside, his neighbor, he doesn't think anything about that. All he thinks about is saved, sanctified, glorified, filled with the Holy Ghost, full stop. What do we do to this man? He may not be born again. He may not be ready for heaven. He is dying. But, you know, church people, religious people, they go their way. And that man dies without a hope of heaven. That's why this other part is there. And love your neighbor. And think of your neighbor. Touch your neighbor. Lift up your neighbor. neighbor care for your neighbor. And fulfill the urgent need of the hour for your neighbor. Is part of the gospel. And then he tells us in verse 28, in verse 28, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right doctrinally. Thou hast answered right according to religion. This do, and thou shalt live. It's the do. If the performance, if the thing that touches, now we cannot see God. I love God. How do I measure that? I don't know your state of mind. I don't know your attitude. I don't know your inner holiness. I cannot know that. The one I can tell is your love for your neighbor, your care for your neighbor, your upliftment for your neighbor, and for you. I cared for my neighbors in the past, but now I came to change, make us international. Now I understand how to love them better, how to touch their lives, how to turn around their lives. That action, I can see. The other one, internal, only God can see that. That's due, and thou shalt live. Verse 29, in verse 29, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that's what we've been doing these days from Thursday. Because many of us thought, my neighbor, that I can help, is the one that attends my house fellowship. If it's not there, if it's sick, I search for him. It's my neighbor. But he's in the larger church. It's not in your nucleus house fellowship. How do you touch him? Because after prayer in the church, you run out. You have another assignment, and you never touch the lives of people you have never met. Who is my neighbor? The one in our denomination, deeper life family, my neighbor. Anywhere I see them, we're in the bus, we're in the vehicle, we're somewhere, and I see somebody, and I say, you look like, tell me, talk now. Aha, uh -huh, that's your neighbor. 
That one who can do anything. He puts his sand in the pocket. He wants to pay the fare for the tree. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. What happened to me? I've not got enough money. Oh, my neighbor, come, come. How much do you need more? I need this. And because that is the church neighbor, you give him. And the man wanted to justify himself. I'm nice. I'm good. Who is my neighbor? What God has revealed to us at this time, between Thursday and today, is that the Muslim is your neighbor. Your hands are there to clap. I'll wait for your clapping. I said the Muslims are your neighbors. Amen. That's what we have learned. Here I came, I spoke. The Muslim brother, minister, the Muslim educator, he has brain. He understands how community should be, how we build community together. And he talks to all of us, Muslims and Christians. And do you see that when they came, and they spoke to us. Did you learn anything? Yes, sir. I said, did you learn anything? Yes, sir. Hold on. When I come and I talk, I don't have a cap on. When he comes and he talks, tell me. He has his cap, pastor. WF. What are you looking at? <laughs> Look at that man having his cap on. Yes, we're in the stadium. We're not in a church building. And so, I don't have to challenge him. He has his cap on. In fact, if he tested me and said, if we're really one, look at my cap, and he gives me one, I will wait. Now, we're talking about understanding who our neighbors are. And the need of our neighbor is that that we fulfill. It's what we look into and we say, this is my neighbor. I want to give him a sense of belonging. That's a neighbor. I want to give him satisfaction. That's he is by my side and by his side and we are thinking in the same way we have a load to carry and both of us are carrying that load together look at Vastachi in Vastachi and Jesus answering said a certain man went down from Jerusalem and it says he was going to Jericho and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his garment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. What a story. And what things we see around us, the people that have been you know, taking away from their families, and their families are asking, how can we get ransom to bail out our son, our daughter? You hear about it, but since you don't think it's your neighbor, you don't do anything. A child is dropping out of school, a good brain, dropping out. And you hear about it. They are not saying, give us money that we can send him to America, to, you know, to Europe. They're saying, even at local school here, this child cannot make it because there's no money. That's when your neighborly attitude, understanding comes in. It's not about, okay, repent. Yes, they'll repent later. When you give them what is bringing sorrow in their heart and, you know, their lives are turned around for the better, they will listen to you more. And so, 
He said, they left him half dead and departed. Verse 31. In verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest, a uh -huh, religious man. That, that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Those are people, they hold on to doctrine, and even if the people around them are dying, doctrine, 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 they are of no use on earth to the people who are suffering. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, and likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him. He didn't see the urgency of the situation. This man could die, blood coming out, because they left him up dead. And blood is the light of the body. And we need to take him up. No, it's not my neighbor. Doesn't look like from my tribe. Doesn't look like my like we in my religion. No, this is non-political. This is non-religious. This is not non-tribal. This is life. And yet he passed on. The other side, verse 32. In verse 32, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He had compassion. He had compassion. He didn't have religion. He had compassion. He didn't have party card. He had compassion. Have you noticed one of the great attributes of God? Old Testament, he had compassion on us. New Testament, and when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them. This man, not religion, not party, not tradition, compassion. That's what the Lord is telling us. If you are saved, have compassion. If you are sanctified, have compassion. And you, you have attained a high level in religion, have compassion. That is what makes the turning point in change makers. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, and he went to him. And he bound him, first age, bound up his wounds, and pouring in oil and wine. Pouring in oil and wine. You understand? Now, there are people that have salvation, forgiveness of sin, morally, they are good, but they do not understand the natural remedies we can apply. They do not understand the place of the oil. You know, if you have a wound and you put Vaseline there to stop the blood coming out and to stop a scar coming up, you know, that's all that. We don't get that from born again, born again, born again. It's the lesson of life. And what we've come to do here this weekend is to give us lessons of life that will make us change agents around us. That, has, that is happening to so and so. I know what to say. I know what to do. I know how to turn things around so that the wounds in his life and the wounds in his, uh, in his heart will not destroy him. He put in oil and wine. And then he set him on his bees. Remember, they had never met. That's the neighbor. And that's what the Lord is telling us, that we stop, we stop looking at the tribe, at the culture, at the color of the skin, at the marks on his face that shows it's coming from here, it's coming from there. The man did not look at any of those parameters. All he did is that 
this is a man like me. I could have been in that situation. And he put him on his bees and brought him to an inn, a local clinic, hospital. And he took care of him. Verse 35. In verse 35, and on the morrow, he actually stopped his journey. Where he should have gone, I have appointment, I have appointment. He said, this life of the neighbor is more important. No, that's what we are saying. That you have the nature of God now. You have the compassion. And you understand, the need of your neighbor is greater than the place you are running to. Urgently, let the word of Christ so teach us that my neighbor is important. I, I, you are hearing crying in the next house. And you are in your house. If you are reading newspapers, you keep on reading newspapers. You didn't even think they are crying there. We've been, you know, we've been living here for a long time. And they're living there for a long time. I never heard cry like that. Why don't you drop the newspaper you are reading and get up and go to the next house. Um, I'm hearing there is, you know, some event happening here. Can I be of help? Is this person just had heart arrest, cardiac arrest, and now we need to take him to the hospital? And there is, there's no vehicle. That's what you are saying. That you say, okay, you dress up, you forget your program for the day. Must do for the day. And you carry him uh, and you get to the hospital and thank God, thank God, a life has been saved. You will be rewarded in heaven. Amen. And so he says, as he was going, he said unto him, Take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again. I will repay thee. That's neighborliness. And then in verse 36, in verse 36, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him? Thinkest thou? Put on your thinking card. Think through life. As you see situations in life, think. If I were in that situation, what would I want somebody to do? If I was in this predicament, what would I want somebody to do? Even if he does not agree with my doctrine, with my church, with my religion, what would I want somebody to do? Sing. And then whatsoever you expect, others will do to you. Do to them likewise. Now think, who do you think is a neighbor to him that fell among the seas? Look at verse 37. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Now he had compassion. And the man, as he answered, he said, he that showed mercy, mercy and compassion, they're together. Somebody is hungry, and because he's hungry, he even wants to go out to go and protest. But I know this man, if the police come to control the protest, he doesn't have the stamina to even run, to escape. And I say, come, before you go out, I don't want you to go out, but I'm not preaching now. Take some food. Have strength. Inner strength. And, and you know people like that, they don't think of their health. When they are rushing out like that, they want to address this issue. Change this one. Change that one. Call them. Call them to reason. The other time when this routing took place, you remember how many people died? Yes, even my brother, he died. He was a first class brain. But when he went out like that, he died. Call them to reason, sit down together. And while you are sitting down together, give them something to chop so that you can address the hunger locally there. You know, we need to take care of people around us so that 
they will think aright, act aright, and they will live right. And so Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. That's the command of Jesus. Preach the gospel, that's command. Go back home and tell what the Lord has done for you. That's another commandment. Love one another as I've loved you. That's another commandment. Here is another commandment from Christ. He didn't say only, go and tell them, repent. Yes, we'll tell them. He said that too. But he also said, go and do thou likewise. My fellow brother, my sister, my daughter, my son, I understand where we're coming from. I taught you for your own sake, for your own life, for your own soul. Repent, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Yes, I taught you that. I'm also teaching you what Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Why will you take only born again, born again, and you'll not take this other side to take care of your neighbor? And so you must understand that Christ is a well-rounded, a well-balanced person. And that's what we're bringing you to. For you not then to, you know, lean back and say, no, this one we're hearing this a week and all that. Did he even talk born again, born again, born again? Look at Jesus here. He didn't introduce born again here. This man needed to understand who his neighbor was. And you need to understand who your neighbor is, and he says, he said to him, and he's saying to you and to me, go and do thou likewise. And if you resist that, uh, when you, you know, throw a commandment away, as if you are not responsible, that's disobedience, that's sin. And so all we have heard this weekend, go and do that likewise. I will. Somebody there, I will. Look at Job chapter 29. In Job chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, when the ear had me then, it blessed me. It blessed me. Their ears hearing me. Oh, this is what I ought to do. This is demanded. This is reasonable. They blessed him. And then he said, And when the eye saw me, it gave witness unto me. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, because I delivered the poor that cried. That's what the Lord is saying. That, that's part of the Bible. Don't say, okay, Job did that. It's written by inspiration. And it is good for doctrine, for instruction, right? That the man may be perfect, matured, well made. And then it says, and the fatherless and him that had, that had none to hell. You know, Joe was available. For, that's what he's called. His integrity, his righteousness, and the life we live will touch the fatherless, will touch the widow. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, the blessing of him that was ready to perish, ready to die, came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. That is righteousness. I caused the widow's heart to rejoice. And if you are hearer of the word, but you are not a doer, then you don't have the blessing of the righteous. Then it goes to the next verse in verse 14. It said, I put on righteousness. 
It's like a doctor treating a patient and putting on the white clothes they normally put on. And Job said, I go through life, I put on righteousness, and it clothes me. My justice, judgment was as a robe and a diadem. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, I was eyes to the blind. Eyes to the blind. Eyes to the blind. Think about that. I, Job, how are you eyes to the blind? The blind man wants to go here. He doesn't know where to go. And I said, I'm here. I can see. And so I will be eyes for you. Where are you going? And then he holds his hand. He forgets his own business. He forgot where he was going. He became eyes to the blind. But Job was not a physician. If Job were a physician, he'll say, I'm eyes to the blind. You don't have the money to treat your eye disease, but I'll pay for the treatment. Eyes for the blind. If uh, Job uh, was, um, you know, somebody that knows how to look at the refraction and everything and recommend glasses, he will recommend the glasses and buy the glasses. That's what the Lord is calling us to. Eyes to the blind and feet was I unto the lame. Feet was I unto the lame. This other fellow, he has eyes, but he doesn't have good, strong feet to carry him. And Job bends down and said, climb on my shoulders. And he climbed on his shoulders, but he could not see. But Job could see eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. And that's what the Lord is telling us to do. He says, go through life and look at the needs around you. And those needs around you with the strong feet you have, with the good eyes you have, with the good ears you have, with the good financial support you have, help the people that are less privileged than you are. And it tells us in verse 16, in verse 16, I will say, Father, to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. Verse 17, in verse 17, and I break the jaws of the wicked, and I plucked out the spoil out of his teeth. And the Lord is saying, don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. The response and the responsibility of a change maker will well do it. Somebody there, I will do it. Number two now, in the role and the role of change makers. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. What will he do? Verse 32. In verse 32, and before him, shall be gathered all nations and all people in the nation that say we we'll follow God, we we'll believe in God, we we'll believe in Christ, all nations. And then it says, and he shall separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. I pray you'll not be a goat. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Verse 34. In verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. And then it says, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation 
of the world. Verse 35. Why? What qualifies them? And born again? Yes. Tell me something practical. The fruit of being born again. The result of being born again. He said, for I was and hungered, I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Verse 36, naked, and ye closed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Verse 37, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Verse 38, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and closed thee verse 39 or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee verse 40 now and the king shall say shall answer and say unto them verily I say unto you Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. That's, that's what the Lord is teaching us this weekend. And look at everybody and treat them as if they were Christ. Don't look at religion. Don't look at tribal marks. Don't look at the party they belong to. Do good to everyone. God is the creator of everyone. And Christ came to save everyone. And this one, although he has not repented, although he is not claiming to be born again, although he does not even know the, uh, the, or the beginning alphabet of the Christian faith, as soon as long as you have done it, Unto this, the least of my brethren. He is not a pastor, he's not a bishop, he's not a reverend, he's not a you know, um, kind of card holder. As a prominent politician that leaves unknown people, help them, visit them, take care of them, because Jesus will say, You've done it to the least of this, my brethren. The nature in you had been changed, transformed. And because of that changed, transformed nature, you are able to do this, come into the kingdom. Look at verse 41. In verse 41, then shall he say unto them on the left and on the left hand, depart from me. Ye cursed into everlasting fire. What? Prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at verse 42. In verse 42, for I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. Uh -uh. Jesus, is it not by grace? Is it by works? Yes, by grace. But grace bears fruit. And where there is no fruit, there's no grace. Is it not? By faith, yes, by faith, but faith bears fruit. And where there's no fruit, there's no faith, it's just mouth talk. I believe, I believe, I believe. That's mental assent. The faith that works, the faith that is recognized in heaven is the faith that bears fruit. He said, I was an hungered, and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty. And ye gave me no drink. Verse 43. And he said, I was a stranger. A stranger. 
What do we call a stranger? It's not of my religion. Strange. It's not, you know, of my tribe. Strange. It doesn't buy my opinion, my ideology. Strange. I was a stranger. And ye took me not in. He said, naked, and ye closed me not sick. And in prison, and ye visited me not. Do you ever visit a prison? No. Thank God, because our people, they know how to watch themselves. They never do anything that gets them to the prison. Good for you. But how about the people who are there? Well, what did they do? They're not of our kind. If they were of our kind, they'll not be there. If that's the way you reason, you'll be surprised on the final day. He said, I was a stranger, and ye took me not in naked, and ye clothed me not sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, it tells us, then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, we saw with thee and hungered, or sir, or sirs, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Look at verse 45. Remember, these are the words of Jesus. Remember, this is not the word of, you know, somebody or identified in the Old Testament. This is New Testament coming from Christ. And you know, he spoke the truth, always spoke the truth. And he said, this is the rule and the standard by which we're going to be judged. Then shall ye answer, shall ye answer them, saying, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to the least of these my brethren, ye did, did not unto me. Verse 46, yes, Christ, that's not my conclusion. Here is his conclusion. Get involved. Help people, touch people's lives. You see hurt, heal. You see stress or distress, relieve them. You see people who are suffering, get them out of their suffering as much as it lies in your power. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Amen. 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 You're going to life eternal. Look at this Revelation chapter 7. The roll call. The roll call. Now we've seen the roll. We'll see what we need to do. Now we'll see the roll. It says, and after this I beheld lo. A great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and languages, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. It says they were clothed with white, white robes and palms in their hands. Look at the next verse there. And it says, they cried, they shouted with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which it tells us seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Verse 11. It says, and all the angels stood round about. It says round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and they fell before the throne and 
day they fell on their faces and worshipped God. Here, that's now in heaven. When the roll is called up yonder, I will be there. I say when the roll, the roll of the righteous, the roll, the register of the people that knew the Lord, not theoretical, not mental, not just doctrinally, they knew the Lord in a practical way. And they did things that showed that they were people that had faith in the Lord and they bought the fruit of that faith. Those are the people that will be there when the roll is called up yonder. You'll be there. You'll be there. Can I then tell you, be a doer of the word. A doer of the word. A doer of the word. The role, responsibility, the role, the register. We're coming to number three now. Number three, the rule and the reign of the almighty change maker. Christ is our king. God is our king. And now I want to see about a God who rules our heart. He rules our mind. He rules our disposition. He rules our way of thinking. He rules our action. If you're a person that, you know, just act and talk and behave and don't bring in a God as the one that rules over you, then how do you belong to him? In Judges chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 4. Judges chapter 8, verse 4, and Gideon came to Jordan and he passed over he and the 300 men that were with him. Faint and yet pursuing. Faint and yet pursuing. There are times the body is not stone. We get tired, but we have something we're pursuing. There are times we faint. We're not stones. And because we faint, we're tired. We're almost getting near burnout. But there's a lie to save. There's a life to rescue. There's a family to counsel. There are people that are sinking in the ocean of life. We need to dive into that ocean and bring them out. He was fainting and yet he pursued. That's the calling that the Lord is giving us. Look at verse 22. Eventually he won the battle. You will win every battle. Then in verse 22, then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. You see, Gideon did what he did with no strings attached. No strings attached. I hope as I do this and do that and do this, he'll make me king over them. I rule you, but he wasn't doing it for that. He was doing it because he was called. He was commissioned. And he said, if I don't get any position, Political position from this, that's all right. And I will still do it again, helping people, the people that hurt. Look at that verse 22, the men, 22, the men of Israel, they said unto him, unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou, thy son, thy son's sons also, for thou has delivered us from the hand of Midian. Verse 23, verse 23, And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. They're not looking for position. Those who help their neighbors, those who heal the hurting, those who have compassion on those who are crushed in life, 
Gideon said, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord, somebody shout, the Lord. Shout that again. He said, the Lord shall rule over you. And for us to give that preeminent position to God, whatever I do, whatever sacrifice I make, I don't do it to rule over people. I leave God to rule over them. And then for God to rule over you. And for God to rule your thoughts and rule your mind and rule your action and rule everything that you do. And you're doing everything unto God. You're not offended. I helped them. They didn't vote for me. What's your goal? I, you know, sacrifice everything I've got. And look at the way they are responding. That's not your business. Let God be the ruler. We're looking at Psalm 146. And I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 146, verse 10. The Lord shall reign forever. The Lord shall reign forever. He rules over us. He reigns over us. He's Lord. He's King. He's the absolute monarch. He's the one that created us. And whatever good he wants us to do, and that's what he has appointed. And he reigns over everything, in every way in our lives. The Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, Unto all generations, even in our own generation here, praise the Lord. You didn't answer that one. When God rules, then we can say, praise the Lord. But if I shirk away from the ruling of God, and I take my thoughts, I go my way, I do whatever I do, and I do not bring that factor in that the eternal one, the God of heaven, will rule over me. If I say praise the Lord in heaven, it has no meaning. That God reigns over my life, over my choices, over everything that I do. If that God is not allowed to rule and to reign in my life, saying praise the Lord it's like a parrot that you keep in the house. And the parrot has said, you praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And one day you come in huh? and the parrot says, praise the Lord. It has no meaning. God will rule in your heart. He will rule in your life. And then you will be able to say an acceptable praise ye the Lord that will be heard in heaven. Amen. I give glory to God for you. That in the rain, in the you know, freshness of the rain and everything, you were still able to look at the word of God. Heaven will reward you. You will go and do good. Every good you do will come into remembrance before the Lord in Jesus' name. We rise up now and we're going to pray. Rise up, we're going to pray. We're calling on deeper life, um, state overseer um, here in River State to lead us in a brief prayer. Please stand up. God bless. Oh, you stood up already. Uh, what a congregation. The favor of the Lord will never end in your life. Joy, happiness will go with you through life. And when we get to heaven, because I am getting there. I am getting there. As I look like this, I say, ah, you, you are from Port Harcourt. You'll be there in Jesus' name.